Welcome everyone to another episode of Timeless Dialogues. I'm your host, Bill Roach, and today we're going to discuss the issue of how to use a study Bible, how to do it, why it's important, and which ones you may want to purchase. Now, as we all know, coming out of the Reformation, one of Wycliffe's main ideals was that every plowboy could read and understand the Bible. And one of the ways God used the reformers was by providing study notes, in particular study Bibles, so that the people could read and understand the text that was before them. Now, we live in a different age and in a different era. And while there are many study Bibles out there, there are also a lot of people like myself who weren't raised around the Bible, who weren't raised around study notes and people teaching you how to study the Bible. So even if you provide them with a study Bible, they need one more tool in their belt, namely somebody to teach them how to actually use a study Bible. So if that is somebody like yourself, what I want to do is I want to actually go through a very basic overview on what is a study Bible? What does a study Bible provide? Which study Bible might be the right one for you? And then discuss basic ways on how to actually use it. In order to do this, what I want to do is go through some of these key topics today. Like I said, how to use a study Bible. How do I actually pick it up read it, and use it for my own spiritual benefit for knowing the Word of God. So first of all, what is a study Bible? We hear them talked about all the time. What is the difference between a study Bible and maybe studying the Bible? Well, first of all, a study Bible provides several things. It gives you introductions to each book of the Bible. So as you go through and you're going to look at each book, you have to ask yourself questions like, who is the author? What kind of genre is this particular book? Is it a historical book? Is it a poetic book? Is it talking about prophecy? And what it's going to do is it's going to give you all of that necessary background to each book of the Bible to help you understand who is writing this book? What's the context of this book? What type of literary features are in this book? Second of all, it's going to give you outlines to each book of the Bible. And when you're reading the Bible, the author wrote with a specific purpose in mind. He wrote with a specific order in mind. He didn't just throw everything together like a last minute term paper in college. He made a clear outline of his books. And when you read the Bible, if you can find these outlines, in many ways, it's trying to just put the main things together and you understand the flow of each book. It brings great coherence and greater understanding to what you're actually reading in the biblical text. A study Bible will also provide good theological articles to explain key doctrines. So a good study Bible is going to go through, and when you're getting to key passages in Scripture that have been used throughout church history to understand a particular topic, they'll write an article about it to help you understand, like, what is original sin? What is the covenant of grace? What is this idea of the perseverance of the saints or any other topic that might pre be presented in the biblical text? They also will provide commentary of key sections of the Bible. When people are buying a study Bible, this is usually what they're most interested in because you're going to read through the biblical text and you're going to come to a particular section. You're going to go, maybe I don't understand that. Or maybe there's something you want to go a little deeper in that particular passage. So you're going to look in the footnote and you're going to find a little commentary that's going to explain a particular verse or maybe a paragraph or maybe even several chapters of the Bible. And that's one of the things that differentiates all the different study Bibles is that people are going to write those commentaries and you're going to see the way that they're approaching the biblical text and the insights of that particular individual in order to help you understand the Bible. And as we go further into this video, we're going to look at some different study Bibles and how they approach the topic. But for now, what you have to see is that it's providing an easy access commentary for you while you're reading the Bible. And why that's important is you, it actually gives you, while you're reading the Bible, all these extra books that you might need to buy without actually having to buy them. It's an all-in-one resource. In addition, it's going to give you a concordance for the Bible. And what a concordance is, is it's going to give you references where key words and key topics are discussed. So if you want to look at maybe the issue of baptism and where the Bible uses that particular word, you'll go to the back, into the concordance, and it's going to give you a small section of them. 
It's not gonna give you every instance, but it's gonna give you some of the most important instances. And this could be for literally hundreds of topics throughout the Bible. And it's gonna give you that key concordance and you can quickly flip to them. And the reason this is important is because sometimes we forget where things are at. And these concordances will help us find a specific verse on a specific topic so you can quickly reference it in your study of the Bible. It's also going to give you cross-references throughout the Bible. And a cross-reference is something where the Bible is discussing a particular topic, but it also discusses that same topic elsewhere. And what they've done with a lot of study Bibles is they'll put in these cross-reference sections the areas where you can go to to find the other passages that talk about those specific topics. And the reason that's important is it it brings the internal coherence of the Bible together. When the biblical authors are writing, it's not as though they're all just writing their own little theologies. Rather, the Bible has one theology. And a cross-reference is going to show you how all the variety of authors across the variety of books come together to make one unified theological message in the text of Scripture. Now, they're also going to provide maps and charts so that as you're going through the Bible and you're wondering, well, how did the Israelites go from Egypt into the promised land? Where is Egypt? Where is the promised land? Or when you're looking at the life of, say, David, you're going to see the different treks that he went on throughout his life. Or you can go into the New Testament. You can see the life of Jesus and all the different places that he went throughout his ministry or the missionary journeys of Paul. And it's going to give you the specific dates and times that you're going to find where they traveled from different specific places, but it's also going to give you the lay of the land and different charts that you're going to find. Charts are going to provide things like, who are all the kings of Judah? Who are all the kings of Israel? What are the specific stops in Paul's missionary journeys? What's the life of Christ, orders and events that are coming about? And that's what a study Bible is going to provide for you. Now, some of them will actually include historic creeds and confessions. For example, the Reformation Study Bible does that, whereas others are going to provide doctrinal statements. And these are more focused by individuals or by institutions. And when I think of that, I'm thinking of something like the MacArthur Study Bible that presents a doctrinal statement in the back or the Ryrie Study Bible. So as we look at this, we might ask ourselves, well, why do I actually need a study Bible? I know what it provides for me, but why do I actually need one? Well, the first reason is to provide in one volume basic introductions and commentary to the Bible. In order to study something, you need resources. And one of the things about a study Bible is that it's in one volume. It can go with you anywhere. So whether you're at the beach or in the mountains, whether you're overseas or sitting in your office or in your living room, you have all of those resources in one place. Now, they might not be the most exhaustive resources, but they're going to be enough to equip you where you're at to read the Bible. Now, they're not made to be the most exhaustive resources. We have extra books in order to accomplish that end, but the purpose of a study Bible is to really just boil all of those things down for an easy access guide for you to read and understand the Bible. The second thing is that if it's a good study Bible, it can help protect you from embracing false doctrines and teach you orthodox doctrines. You know, one of the things that we found with the Geneva Study Bible is that the reformers put notes into the biblical text so that when people were reading the Bible in their own language and maybe they didn't understand it or they had the influence from outside organizations or maybe outside churches or outside movements, they could read these notes and get a clear correction against false teaching and a clear embrace and vision of orthodox teaching. So again, if it's a good study Bible, it's going to protect you from error and teach you that which is good. Now, there are some really bad study Bibles out there. For example, the Dake study Bible is riddled really with heresy. It's going to teach you false doctrines. It's going to give you a false view of God. Or you can have what might be study Bibles from the different cults where they're going to give their commentary on the biblical text that are just erroneous. They're false. So what you need is you need to to pour into this idea of finding a good study Bible from trusted resources. And if it's a good study Bible by trusted resources, it's going to accomplish that goal. It's going to help you learn the Bible. It's something that you can rely upon and it's something that you can trust for years throughout your life. In addition, 
like I said, they provide a commentary at a level for the average person. Notice that it's not a commentary for the academic and academics going to try to get into all these linguistic things and they're going to try to get into the original languages and they're going to try to get into all these issues related to historical details that are important and necessary and we need to look into them, but maybe they're outside of the scope of the average person or they're going to get off in all of these rabbit trails when the reality is you just need the kernel, the, the husk of what the key issues are written in a way that you can understand it. Now, that's not to say that people are uneducated or they can't understand them, but what they're trying to do is write at a level for the broadest possible audience. So they're going to raise your level and knowledge of the Bible without going over your head. And that's the whole point is that if you actually communicate something and when you get done, people say, oh, that was wonderful. That was great. But I didn't understand a word of what you're saying. Well, you didn't actually accomplish what needed to be done in that very instance. I've heard it put like this. Far too many preachers preach to preachers, not to people. And if we do that with our study Bibles, well, then we're not actually reaching the audience that needs the Bible, namely the people of God in the pews who need to hear the word of God, be changed by it, have their minds transformed by it, and readily take that and bring true reformation in their families and throughout society. In addition, they're going to motivate you to continue reading the Bible, specifically through books or sections of books that are difficult to understand. We've all tried to read the Bible. You go through Genesis, and then you get to Exodus. In Leviticus, you're like, oh, this is a difficult one. And then you get to Numbers, and maybe you stop right there. And one of the reasons people stop is because they don't understand what they're reading. And that's fine. You know, like anything, you have to spend time with it in order to know it better. But in another sense, you also need somebody to help you understand the biblical text. That's what the body of Christ is for. Some are pastors, some are teachers, some are evangelists, or all the different spiritual gifts that we find given in the New Testament. But those who are teachers, God has given the ability to understand the biblical text, and whether they preach the Word of God from a pulpit or write down a commentary, they're still teaching you the Word of God. So it's, in many ways, the head and the hand and the rest of the body coming together to equip you to understand the Bible. But notice, it's looking at specific passages that might be difficult. And one of my encouragements for you is that if something's difficult, don't stop. Keep pressing through. Keep reading through that book of the Bible and spend time in those study notes trying to understand what it's actually trying to communicate to you. Also, a study Bible is going to provide manageable reading plans through the Bible. Like anything, you can't eat an elephant in one bite. You got to eat it in small chunks, one bite at a time. You don't run a marathon and get prepared for a marathon by just going out one day saying you're going to run the whole thing. You have to train. You have to work your way through. You have to take manageable pieces and make manageable goals to get through any major objective in life. And the same is with the Bible. If you don't really have a good plan for getting through the Bible, you will stay away from the harder passages. You'll kind of float to the passages that make you feel good or that you're most comfortable with. But if you have a good reading plan through the Bible, and these are just one of many, there are a variety of reading plans that can be provided for you. It's going to help you set goals and meet goals through the biblical text. And it's also going to encourage you to read sections and portions of the Bible that maybe you wouldn't want to read. So like I said, in one volume, a study Bible is going to teach you orthodox doctrine at your level in a way that you can understand the biblical text and encourage you to get through those biblical texts. Now, here's the big question. How do I actually use a study Bible? When I get one, say you get one for Christmas or your birthday or you're at a bookstore, you buy one online, it arrives, you open it up and you look at it, and you might be overwhelmed. There's all these notes and there's all these cross-references, but how do I actually use this text? Well, first of all, I would encourage you to read the introductions to each book. Take the time and go and see who is the author, what's the literary type, what's the, the flow of the biblical text that's being presented to us. Second, review the outline for each book of the Bible. Now, notice I said for each book of the Bible. 
as you're going through, we realize that Matthew is not John and John is not Romans and Romans is not 1 Samuel. They all have their own outline. And in order to understand each book of the Bible, you actually have to understand the basic outline and flow of each book of the Bible. And there are different ways and different outlines that you can make of each book. But in general, we recognize that the consensus of faithful Bible teachers see specific outlines through each book of the Bible. And this is going to help you understand different sections. For example, when you're going through, say, the Gospel of Matthew, and you're looking in the beginning, you see what might be known as the birth narrative, how Jesus was born, and how that's different from when he was off in Egypt, and how that might differ from the Sermon on the Mount, or any other section of Matthew. And if we understand the flow of what's going on, you understand the story, the narrative, the point that's being presented in each biblical text. You can also approach them in a variety of ways, but the best thing to do is to actually read the text of Scripture first. And as you're going through, you see these introductions and you see the outlines, but as you're actually going through, go read the biblical text. Don't get caught up in all the commentary on the biblical text, because the most important thing is to know what is actually in the Bible. Keep pressing through those different sections of the Bible. So read the biblical text first. However, read the commentary of the scriptures second. So as you're going through, for example, read all of John chapter 1. And there are going to be sections that you don't understand. Take note of it. Write it down. But as you're going through and you finish, you can look at different sections. Okay, I don't understand chapter 1 verse 3. And as the Study Bible discusses that. You can read the passage and you can read the commentary. But here's one of the big issues that I found. A lot of people tend to get more interested in the commentary rather than the actual Bible. And that's putting the cart before the horse. You need to be interested in reading the Bible first and foremost and the commentaries secondarily. Because the whole point of God giving us the Bible is so that you can understand the Bible not just the notes somebody wrote about the Bible. Again, they kind of go together like a hand and a glove, but you have to get the order right. You need to understand that the biblical text is what's inspired, not the commentaries that are written underneath the text. So here's some of my advice for you. Make sure you spend more time reading the biblical text than the commentary. Know the commentaries are limited, and you may need to consider other resources to find a deeper or more elaborate answer to specific issues. You know, when they're putting together a study Bible, they're not discussing everything. They're not discussing every issue. And it's a limited resource. So if you're going, well, this study Bible doesn't answer all my questions. Well, it can't. That's not the scope and purpose. It's to answer the big questions and the big issues. So if you run into something like that, many people who write these study Bibles also write much larger and longer biblical commentaries. And you may need to go pick one of them up where they're going to go in a lot more detail and depth on whichever specific passage or issue you are trying to understand. But finally, like I said, remember these are limited commentaries, not exhaustive commentaries. And you will need to use those outside resources from other scholars and faithful people down through the ages to actually understand the biblical text. So here are a few examples of what I'm talking about. This I picked up from the Reformation Study Bible and their PDF version, and I just screenshotted them so that you can actually understand what I'm trying to talk about. When you see this here, it's going to give you things like the title and the author, and it's going to look at what's the title of the book, what's the purpose of this book, who is the author. And in this specific instance, they're looking at the book of Ephesians. So Paul would be the author, and the book of Ephesians gets its name because it was actually wrote for the Ephesians. Just like the book of Romans, the audience was the Romans, or 1 Corinthians, it was Corinthians. Now, we can't always apply that to every book of the Bible. For example, 1 Samuel wasn't written to 1 Samuel. And that's why these are important, because it's going to let you know who wrote the book, and who's the audience of the book, because each one's different. That's why I said, as you're going through, you need to read these introductory materials to understand who is the author, who is the audience, what are they trying to communicate. 
Here are other things that it's going to look at. The date and literary features. When was this book written? To whom was this book written? And in which genre was this book written? And by genre, it simply means things like this. When the Bible presents a historical narrative, such as Genesis 1 through 11, or the whole book of Genesis, or the history of Israel and the kings, or the life of Christ, those are written with specific historical narratives in place. But they differ from something like the Psalms, which may have historical things that they're discussing, but it's using poetry. And also, when you get into the New Testament, you're going to find things like the epistles, which are written in more of like a, a letter format for people to understand. So the point is this. You want to interpret historical narrative as historical narrative. You want to interpret poetry as poetry. You want to interpret sort of the epistles as an epistle. And to confuse them is to misinterpret the Bible. And you say, well, how do I know which one? How do I know which genre it is? Well, that's why you look at these dates and literary features, and it's going to explain to you what is poetry? How does poetry function in the Bible? So that as you're reading it, you can understand the text that's before you in a manageable way so that you yourself can understand and interpret the Bible. Now, here's what a possible outline of a specific book of the Bible may look like. And this, again, is coming from the Reformation Study Bible, and it's their outline of the book of Ephesians. Now, notice a few things. The bold points there, the, the very big points that stand out are giving you the big and major sections of each book, and in particular with this one, the book of Ephesians. So it's going to give you the salutation, which is like the greeting. And then point two, the praise to God and blessing in Christ. Point three, prayer for the church. Point four, our position in Christ. Point five, prayer for the church and doxology. And then in the second section, and this is just where the outline shows us, it starts to apply this, our walk in Christ, our stand against the spiritual forces of darkness, and then the final greetings that are presented in the text. So the point is, is that in this, we see in the first half of the book, Paul gives an introduction with a lot of doctrine and theology. And in the second half, he's going to give us a lot of application and a conclusion. But here's what I also want you to see. In point two, it says, praise to God for blessings in Christ, but then it also gives us subpoints, which are extra topics that are being discussed under that big heading. And in this, it's, what does it mean to be elected by the Father, redeemed by the Son, and sealed by the Spirit? Or in the next section, point four, what does it mean to apply the gospel? What does it look like to have unity as the body of Christ, to have a new mind, or to walk in as it says here, unity, love, purity, light, and wisdom. The point is, is that as you understand these outlines of the Bible, you understand the flow of each book. So spend time there. As you're reading the biblical text, flip back and forth between the outlines so you keep the, the big view in mind. And let me give you an explanation. Whenever I go on a trip, I like to have a map. I like to have the big map, and I don't want a small map. I want one that's going to give me the whole picture of where I'm going and what's going on. So whenever we travel, I want one of the entire United States, and I want to see I'm going from this state to that state. That's going to give me the big picture of where I'm going, but I can't just stop there. Sometimes I have to have smaller maps so I can get through specific cities and specific areas, and that's exactly what this is doing. It's giving you a big map. And it's going to give you smaller maps so you see where you're going, not only throughout the proverbial country, but through each major city and town along your trip. And that's what it's doing through the Bible. It's going to give you the big picture of each book and the big picture of the Bible, and it's going to give you a picture of those smaller sections. Now, let's look at the commentary here. And I just want to explain how do we actually use this commentary? How does it make sense? So in the middle section there, the section you're going to see the Bible has the big number one for this one, which is going to give us Ephesians chapter one. And included in that, you're going to see specific verses. So chapter one, verse one, chapter one, verse two. And however many chapters there are in the Bible, there's also going to be verses that are going to follow it. Now, the thing to know is that the chapters and verses were later editions. They're not part of the original 
text, but they're there to help you understand and read and navigate throughout the biblical text. Now, I know it may be hard to see a little bit here, but on the section right next to it, you're going to see these different verses, and you're going to see other verses. You're going to go, why, why does it have those other verses? Well, those right there are your cross-references. So if you're reading Ephesians chapter 1 and you want to see it talk about that topic somewhere else, the Bible's going to give that to you. These study Bibles are going to provide that for you. In addition, sometimes you'll see little letters in there. So you're going to see lots of cross-references with a little letter. Well, that little letter is going to be an even more detailed cross-reference, a very specific cross-reference for you. Now, what I want you to also see is at the bottom. You have the Bible on the top, the cross-reference on the center section, but you're going to have the commentary on the bottom. So when you're going through and you're looking at chapter 1, verse 1, and you want a little bit more explanation, you take your finger, you go down to the bottom, and you're going to see chapter 1, verse 1, and then notes about it. And that's how you put them together. That's how you navigate your way through the study Bible. Now, one point that you need to realize is that there won't be a note for every verse in the Bible. But the big picture of each book is going to be given to you. And if you need more information, like I said earlier, go and consult a, another commentary or maybe even another study Bible because sometimes they're going to give it in those notes. Just realize they're going to give you the big picture with thorough and faithful notes, even though they're not going to be exhaustive notes. So let me summarize it again. The biblical text is in the center. Many of them provide cross-references, and then the commentary is going to correspond to the chapter and the verse below. Now, some study Bibles are going to provide articles that are going to help explain key theological doctrines to help na you navigate through the biblical text. They're usually going to be more theological in nature, and by that I mean they're going to not just be a commentary about a historical point or even a point being made in the biblical text. Rather, they're going to try to take all the places where the Bible discusses that particular doctrine and bring them together. In many ways, they're like a systematic theology. We're going to bring all of the different points and pieces of the Bible together, har <clears throat> harmonize them, and try to understand how they can come together for you to understand them in your reading of the Bible. For example, in this instance, it's going to discuss the church. And what is the church? How does the church function? What does it mean for us to say that we're part of the body of Christ and part of the church? So again, it's going to be key articles to help you understand big systematic doctrines. So here's the big question. Which study Bible should I buy? And this is a big question that you need to answer for yourself. In my personal opinion, I recommend three study Bibles, the Reformation Study Bible, the ESV Study Bible, and the MacArthur Study Bible. Now, there are differences between each of them. They're all faithful, they're all orthodox, but here's some of the difference. The ESV Study Bible is something that's going to be given from a host of confessional evangelicals committed to evangelical orthodoxy, but it's going to bring a whole variety of scholars together to discuss the biblical text. They're going to give you a more broad approach to the different interpretations that people might have. For example, they're going to, say, discuss the book of Revelation, and they're going to explain the pre-mill view, the ah-mill view, the post-mill view. They're going to discuss maybe an idealistic view, all these different approaches to the biblical text. They're going to give you a variety of different ones. They're not going to really just lock down on a particular view. But again, when it comes to the essentials, the first order issues of Christianity, they're going to be in uniformity with these other study Bibles. It's not like they're going to present something like, oh, you know, here's the deity of Christ and the non-deity of Christ. They're going to be fully committed to the deity of Christ in those instances. Now, let's take another one, the Reformation Study Bible. It's going to be committed to really an understanding of the Bible from the Reformers. So, like the ESV Study Bible, they're going to have different scholars that are coming together, but all of these scholars are going to be Reformed in their understanding of the biblical text. And one of the things that you're going to find with the Reformation Study Bible is that they're going to try to remain consistent with that perspective, and the articles are going to be written from that perspective. And another thing that the 
Reformation Study Bible is going to do is it's going to give you creeds and confessions in the back of the Bible, the historic creeds, the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, but it's also going to give you confessions like the Belgic Confession or the Westminster Confession. It's also going to give you catechisms like the Westminster Shorter and Larger Catechism. And one thing that's unique about this one is that it also includes like the London Baptist Confession of Faith. So whether you're affirming the Westminster Standards, or you're going to have the London Baptist Confession, both Reformed in their confessions, they're going to be included in the Study Bible, whereas the other two are not going to have those creeds and confessions and some of those extra articles added. Now, the ESV Study Bible will have articles in it, but they're not going to be written specifically from a Reformed perspective. Now, let's jump to the other side. You've got the MacArthur Study Bible, which was written by the very famous preacher John MacArthur, and he composed this over a number of months, and it's written by him. He doesn't have a whole host of other scholars coming together to help him understand and write this commentary, meaning that he was the main person putting it together. Other people helped edit the final form of his commentary, and obviously a publisher came together to put it into its final form. But this is MacArthur's study Bible. It was written by MacArthur. All of the notes come directly from John MacArthur. And a lot of people like that because they want to have one person giving sort of that consistent approach to the biblical text. Some people don't like that because they don't like the fact that only one person's influence was given into that commentary. So here's my experience with each of them. In many ways, I used the MacArthur Study Bible for a long time, and I still do. And the thing that I found with the MacArthur Study Bible is that it's going to present probably more details about the biblical text in the New Testament than some of the others. He's going to go more in depth on a lot of them. And in the MacArthur Study Bible, he's going to give you great cross-references, and he's going to also give you more of a doctrinal statement in the back of the book, which is really the doctrinal statement that MacArthur would, would hold to and that the Master's Seminary would hold to. I have the ESV Study Bible. I use it quite often. I'll admit I don't use it as much as the others, and the reason is because sometimes they don't go as in-depth on some of the secondary and third-order issues that I would like even though they're presenting those. I want a little bit more commentary to go. Now, I think this is a great study Bible. I would encourage you to get it. But currently right now, I mainly use the Reformation Study Bible. And the reason for it is because I like their introductory notes. I like the fact that it has the creeds and the confessions in the back of it. And my point really in saying that is, I think it probably has the most material that's going to present in one place and at one time. So again, what you need to do is you need to go and find which study Bible works best for you. And I would recommend any of these. I carry and use all of them. It really just kind of depends on what I need it for at that particular time, where I'm traveling, and what I'm trying to do with the biblical text. So again, I want to encourage you with this video, buy a study Bible, review this video to understand how to use a study Bible, and ultimately the goal is this, I want you to actually study the Bible. So again, I want to thank all of you for listening to this. I hope that this will encourage you to pick up a study Bible. Please leave any comments down below if you have any questions or concerns. But again, thank you. This is Bill Roach, Timeless Dialogues.